On January 15th, 1919, a two million gallon tsunami of molasses exploded from a giant steel vat located at Purity Distilling Company in Boston, Massachusetts. It annihilated everything in its path, crushing buildings, killing and trapping people and animals in its sweet, viscous wake. Such an unusual disaster sounds like the work of fiction, but unfortunately is shockingly real. Just a day or two prior to the disaster, U.S. Industrial Alcohol, the parent company of Purity Distilling Company, received a shipment of 2.3 million gallons of molasses from Puerto Rico, all of which went into their custom-built steel container. The immense container was built in 1915 to facilitate extraordinarily high demands for explosives during World War I. Molasses was distilled inside the vat to make industrial alcohol, which was then sold to weapons companies, where it was used to manufacture explosives. Owing to the rush created by this demand, corners were cut in the construction of the steel tank. Once complete, the tank was an imposing structure at 50 feet tall by 90 feet wide. At maximum capacity, the container was capable of holding an amazing 26 million pounds of molasses. This is the equivalent weight of 64 Boeing 747 airliners, or precisely 2,000 full-grown African elephants. Employees noted that the tank would regularly make groaning sounds when being filled. Children would bring cups to collect sweet molasses that dripped from the cracks in the tank's seams. Warning signs were there that something was wrong with the tank, but management ignored the concerns of workers, stating that there was nothing that could be done. In fact, a laborer working for U.S. Industrial Alcohol brought metal shavings that had come from inside the tank to demonstrate the tank's inadequacy to the company's treasurer, who responded, I don't know what you want me to do. The tank still stands. On that cold Wednesday afternoon in January, the tank ruptured abruptly at 12.30 p.m., what ensued was pure chaos. Witnesses noted a deep rumble in the ground occurring before they knew what was happening. A wave of molasses exploded from the vat, traveling at 35 miles per hour, cresting at 40 feet high and spanning 160 feet across. The thick liquid ripped through the streets with such force that it tipped a nearby streetcar off its tracks, almost causing it to topple. Buildings and homes were knocked off their foundations. Some were completely destroyed in the wave. Significant structural damage was done to nearby Boston Elevated Railway, caused by the panels of the destroyed molasses tank smashing into it with extreme force. Several blocks around the area were quickly flooded with two to three feet of molasses. Numerous people and horses were trapped in the sticky, viscous liquid. Because of the stickiness and the thickness of the molasses, which is about 40% denser than water, people struggled to free themselves from beneath the sludge. Disturbingly, the Boston Post reported, horses died like so many flies on sticky flypaper. In all, 21 people died as a result of this disaster, and 150 more were injured. Several of the victims succumbed to asphyxiation, both during and after being inundated by the wave. Being in the middle of January, the liquid was thicker due to the cold. This fact made the substance more difficult to clean and more difficult to escape from, and it only became worse as it got colder throughout the day and into the evening. It took several days to clear enough of the molasses to allow rescuers to get to the remainder of the tank to search for survivors. Firefighters worked tirelessly with their fire hoses to clear the mess, but they made no progress. The molasses was too thick. Fortunately, this event occurred right on the Boston Harbor because it wasn't until about four days later when they sprayed seawater from the city's fireboat that they were able to successfully dissipate and clear the molasses. The salt from the water was effectively able to dissolve it. It was only at this point that rescuers were able to begin dismantling the molasses tank in search of the survivors. The cold January weather may have been partially responsible for the tank failing when it did. It turns out that the steel the tank was made from was mixed with too little manganese when it was manufactured. This meant that when it got cold, it would become brittle. At the time of the disaster, it was 40 degrees Fahrenheit, well below the threshold for this to occur. This only compounded the fact that the steel the tank was made from was also too thin. 
about 11 16th of an inch thick at the bottom and just over a quarter inch thick at the top. The design and layout of the rivets created another issue. The flawed design placed too much pressure on the rivets. This was clearly indicated by the cracks that were formed where the walls of the tank were joined by rivets. It was also evident when the rivets popped from the tank during the rupture and shot from it like machine gun fire. The flawed construction of this vat should have been known and remedied by U.S. industrial alcohol. Instead, hasty construction was prioritized over safe practices. After the flood, 119 individuals filed a civil lawsuit against U.S. industrial alcohol. The suit, Door v. the United States Industrial Alcohol Company, alleged that the tank was unsafe. The counter-argument made by U.S. industrial alcohol was that it was not unsafe. Rather, the vat must have been sabotaged by evilly disposed persons. They insisted that someone had blown the tank up with explosives. This civil case would turn out to be unprecedented in a number of ways. Namely, it was the first case to make extensive use of authorities in relevant fields as expert witnesses, professional architects, metallurgists, engineers, and many others were called to give testimony regarding the events. Furthermore, it made a tremendous impact on building and inspection processes. This event inspired laws to be developed to outline procedural requirements for both planning and execution of building projects. In fact, when the VAT was built, it didn't even require a permit or oversight. This changed drastically after the Great Boston Molasses Flood. At the conclusion of the years-long case in 1925, the plaintiffs prevailed. After thousands of witness testimonies and the conflicting reports from experts, the state auditor ruled that it was negligence on the company's part that caused the tank's failure. The court ordered U.S. Industrial Alcohol to pay $628,000 in damages, an amount worth over $10 million in 2022. The Great Boston Molasses Flood was a truly horrific event. Even after the initial rescue, it took hundreds of people several weeks to finally clear all the molasses from the streets. And it's said that, in the heat of the summer, the molasses could be smelled for decades after. This disaster, now the site of a few waterfront baseball fields, is commemorated by a small green plaque summarizing the entire event into a single concise paragraph. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Hit the bell icon to get notifications when I release a new video. If you're interested in supporting Motive Horror and gaining access to exclusive perks and merchandise, use the link in the description to become a patron on my Patreon. Until next time.